Could you explain to a layperson what is technical art history? That is when you combine traditional art history, which is about stylistical investigation of the motif and the composition and the iconography, when you combine this with technical analysis of the materials used in the painting. The choices the artist does to take uh, a panel or a canvas, uh, what type of ground layer, what kind of pigments to achieve his composition. When you first heard about this project, what were your first thoughts? Fantastic to have an opportunity to combine at first instance two paintings because there was the Italian painting and the Copenhagen painting and uh, we very much uh, wanted to compare the two to understand which one uh, was made before the other. Was there a link between them? Could it be the same workshop? And when the project evolved and became a project with all four paintings, that just became even more fascinating because as you will see when you come to the exhibition, there are so many stories to learn from this show. Could you tell us briefly about these four different paintings? Where do they come from uh, or where were they found when you know, this project started? When uh, your painting was obviously here in Tallinn and it has a history of traveling around uh, from the uh, former Soviet Union and it came back to, to Tallinn uh, after having been in St. Petersburg. The Copenhagen painting came to our museum in 1932, was given as a gift to the museum, but was at that time acquired at a uh, art uh, dealer in Germany. The Glasgow painting has been in Glasgow uh, for, for many years, and uh, then there's the, the fourth painting, the largest of the four, which has been in a private collection in Spain for many years. And fortunately for this project, the painting uh, came on auction at Sotheby's uh, just two years ago and we immediately made contact to the auction house in London and we got uh, via Sotheby's uh, the possibility to examine also this painting. So what was thought about the authors of these paintings before? When uh, the Copenhagen National Gallery uh, got their painting in 1932 it was attributed to Peter Bruegel the Elder. And that attribution, uh, which was made on art historical grounds, uh, stylistically and comparing figures and details, was done by uh, the, one of the best known art historians of the time, uh, Friedländer. And he wrote a small article to our magazine at the museum uh, explaining uh, why our painting was uh, Peter Bruegel the Elder. And he also mentions the other three paintings in his article. So they were all known to him and had been seen at various points. Uh, so we thought it was Peter Bruegel the Elder for some years, but already during the 1940s, uh, some questions were put in there. Was it more Bosch or was it after Bruegel? Uh, and all this art historical discussion has been going on ever since. And until we started this research, our painting was still in the gallery as Peter Bruegel the Elder or School of. And therefore, the research that we have been doing, uh, with in including also technical studies, has been crucial to, to find out more about how are the paintings interrelated. We see four paintings that are very, very similar to the smallest details. Um, how is that possible? What were your first ideas about that? How that did that come about? Well, uh, the first thing one considers is, of course, is one of the four paintings the model for the other ones? Uh, because we know that in, uh, in 16th century studios, uh, artist workshops, you make one version, and if that version is popular, that's called the principal, then you make a number of copies, a number of variations or replicas, and they're going out and being sold on the art market. So. One idea was, of course, is there one of these that could be the first version and the other ones from the same workshop? But the technical study using also infrared uh, reflectography, looking below the paint layer, uh, where we can see the first sketch and drawing that's below the paint layer, clearly reveals that we are talking about four different masters, four different types of handwriting, you could say. The calligraphy of the way of, of drawing is very individual and different from each uh, of the four paintings. So already there we could say, well, 
it's not the same person that has mass produced uh, these uh, paintings. Uh, and the question was then, could it be uh, that it is a number of different people within the same workshop? But there are still a number of small details that differ significantly from one to the other. And there's one detail in the Copenhagen and Italian painting which is very clearly illustrating that uh, the two paintings have not been made while the other one was available. Because there's a small boy to the very right and in the Italian painting he has a red jacket yeah. and a grey cap and in the Copenhagen painting he has a red cap and a white bonnet. So clearly they have not been looking after each other. So there is an interval. But nevertheless you see a, a great uh, array of, of, of details that are exactly the same. Absolutely. So the next thing to look for is of course could there have been a pounce? Could there have been a tracing taking place? Uh, and I think that what we today believe most is that there must have been a kind of a set of drawings that may have been copied and used in various workshops. And if a drawing is copied into another drawing by hand, looking at the drawing, then small mistakes will take place. And then that drawing will be the master for a number of paintings or a painting in another workshop. So that would explain the small differences. And it really is a game of finding the differences between one painting and the other. Um, but with the large painting from the private collection, we can see that there are actually small uh, lines that indicate that, uh, that a, a master model has been placed over the panel before it was drawn. There are some uh, small pass points uh, where the drawing had to fit, uh, and then it has been shifting slightly at some moments. So I think that, that painting tells us a little bit more about the availability of different models. But apparently there must have been a one original, the, the main... We original. think there must have been one original composition that has then been, been, uh, been used in various workshops, traced and copied and used in workshops for the paintings. If the original was made by either Bosch or Bruegel, that's still the question. We cannot be sure that that is the case. When you started this project, or you started um, using the methods of uh, technical art uh, history um, on this particular painting, what did you exactly do? How did you? Uh, uh, what were the first steps? Yeah, the first step you do is first of all to look at it very carefully, to really get to know the front and the back of the painting in every detail. And you use a, a magnifying glass on your, your glasses, on optimizer, uh, and you simply get to know it. Next thing you would do is to make an x-ray. Like you do x-rays of bodies, you can make an x-ray of a painting. And those areas in the painting that contains pigments, which contains again metal, like the white pigment in the 16th century is called lead white. It's made from lead. Uh, a corrosion product of lead mixed with oil that makes the white paint. Well, that is uh, radioabsorbent, which means that, that would show as white on the X-ray film, just like the bones in a body will show white on the X-ray film. And where you have the flesh, where the X-ray goes straight through, that's the areas where you have other sorts of pigments. And they're all kind of grayscales. So you'd make an X-ray to understand the composition. If changes have been taking place, you can sometimes see these changes thanks to the x-ray because other, t other elements would have been laying on top and therefore there's a double layer of paint and therefore you can see that on the x-ray. The second step would be to make uh, a photograph with infrared imaging. And that is a special tool uh, which we know from uh, these smart bombings in, in warf warfare where you can see uh, at night uh, and that's the same kind of technology we use for paintings. It was developed during the, the Korean War, actually this technique, and where we can look uh, through the paint layers and down to the white ground layer below the paint. That will reflect the infrared radiation, which is in fact heat. But where carbon is present, that means charcoal, black paint, uh, that will absorb the infrared radiation and therefore show on a special camera uh, the, white, the black lines. So with the infrared camera we can see the entire drawing and all the areas where black has been used. 
That is contrary to the X-ray, where you primarily see all the areas where white have been used. So combining these two will give you a lot of new information about how the paint layer has been built up. In this particular case, such as, what kind of information did you get from X-ray or uh, UV? Well, from the X-rays you can see uh, a number of the, uh, the elements with, with heavy atom numbers uh, in, in, the, in the pigments, which we can compare from one to the other. If they were some of the, one of the paintings, for instance, would have been later than the 17th or 18th century, then the lead white would have been substituted by another pigment. So it's kind of confirming to us if the pigmentation in all four paintings is looking the same, that they are from the same period. X-ray is, of course, a non-destructive, and it's not damaging uh, the painting. Uh, an analysis which doesn't take out samples. You can take out small samples from the paint layer as well, very microscopic, about, uh, about a, a fraction of a millimeter. And these samples you can put into a small uh, container with polyester, you fill it up and you can grind it and then you have the layers of the paint from the, from the uh, uh, panel at the back and then the layers that was applied on top. And you could see them like an archaeological uh, investigation. But that is, of course, taking material away. And we would try first to make as many analyses as possible without removing original material to see if that gives us uh, the information we need. And with the infrared imaging, we got uh, a very clear picture of the drawings, as I mentioned, uh, the drawings of the individual artists. And especially the, uh, the, the large private painting is, is interesting in that respect because it has two drawings on top of each other. First, there's a very thin drawing with what looks like a pencil. And then there's a drawing on top, which is done with a very fine brush that simply traces the first initial drawing. And that fine line with the brush has then been followed with the paint layer. In the Glasgow painting, in the Tallinn and the Copenhagen painting, it's all done with a brush, uh, with, with, uh, excuse me, it's all done with, uh, with charcoal, or a pencil-like uh, tool. And then there's dendrochronology. Indeed. Dendrochronology uh, means uh, using the wood to make a chronology, a dating of the wood. And all, all four panels, uh, all four paintings are painted on oak wood. And uh, of course this oak wood once was a tree growing somewhere in the world. And dendrochronologists that is the, the people who do this as their métier, uh, they go in and look at the, when we let, put the painting on a table, you can look at the end grain. And at the end, you have the year rings, the annual rings, like we know from a, from a tree that's been felled. And not only can we count them, but we can also measure the difference uh, and the distance between each individual uh, year ring. And by measuring this, we get a, a, like a barcode uh, white uh, year rings, annual rings from a good summer and narrow ones from a dry summer. And we get kind of a sequences and if we have enough of these sequences we can place them next to each other and see how they correspond. And there are chronologies from today and until before Christ where we can see how woods were growing, where you take recent wood from this floor for instance, measure this and take something from an older house and you can build chronologies back in time. Well, we started with having one uh, dendro dating done on your painting here in, in Tallinn and uh, it was very clear that the oak planks used for your painting were once a tree growing in the eastern part of Poland and this tree was felled sometimes around 1557, close to 1560. So that means that your painting must have been painted some years after 1660, uh, 1560. The next painting we investigated was the Copenhagen painting. And again, the wood used for it came from the eastern part of Poland, so Baltic timber. And uh, the Copenhagen wood uh, has been uh, felled around 1563. So just a few years after the tree that was felled You're for your painting. You're able to tell that, that exactly? Well, uh, we can say that it's after 50, uh, 1563, because that's the last ring we have. On top of this, there should be X number of rings plus the sapwood. 
because a tree consists of hardwood and then there's a number of sapwood rings and then comes the bark on the outside. The bark is always removed. The sapwood should always be removed if you are a good carpenter in the, in the 16th century and it has been in our paintings. But we know that in the Polish region there is between uh, 15 and 20 sapwood rings. So we always have to add this number to the last annual ring that we can detect. So if we say 1563 and add another 15 to 20 uh, years, then we have the moment when the painting most probably would have been done. What were the uh, biggest surprises for you in this uh, project, in this investigation? Well, I think that uh, to continue the, the, the story about the dendrochronology was that we just last week had an opportunity also to date the uh, privately owned painting. And uh, that was uh, very interesting to see that there the latest year ring is from about 1530, which means that uh, the large painting in the show is probably the oldest of them all so closest to the origin of the composition. And that is again 1530 plus 10, 15 years from Sapwing. Uh, that would say that we are still after Euronymous Bosch, but we are closer to his period of working than we are with the other one. However, this particular painting, the private collection painting, looks the, the brightest, the newest. It does it's indeed. Later. Yeah, well, it has, uh, by, by sheer luck, come down through history in a very good condition. It has been in a private collection for many, many years, and maybe that would uh, account for it. But it's also an entirely different hand that, that paints. Uh, uh, an earlier painting which really uses all the, uh, the harsh colors of, of that uh, period, apparently, but also uh, has a different style of painting the more grotesque figures than we see in the other, uh, mainly the two paintings from uh, Tallinn and Copenhagen. What, what was most fascinating for you in this project? Well, it's, it's utterly fascinating to compare a number of paintings that look so alike, but yet still are so very different. And by looking at them with the different techniques and studying them in close detail, uh, discussing the results between art historians and scientists and conservators, you begin to get a feeling of what is the person behind each of the individual paintings that they are individuals, they have their own way of creating this. Although they look alike, they're very individual in the way they have been, uh, been created. I think that is the fascinating thing, because at first glance you say, well, four paintings, they look very alike. But there's an, a, a world of difference between them, after all. Was there anything that really surprised you? Well, I think the main surprise is that, uh, that the private painting is so much earlier than the other ones, uh, but also uh, just to understand the, 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 uh, the differences in, in detailing, there are elements which seem to be alike in the two, two and two, the small figure in the middle uh, uh, with this grotesque figure sitting with a ball on its head has a pig's face in two of the painting and a male face in two of the other ones. Are they closer or are they not to each other? And of course it's also fascinating that you have a number of animals missing in your painting uh, animals that you see in the other paintings. Uh, but with infrared uh, studying, we can see that the animals are still present in your painting. At some point, somebody apparently decided to paint them out. And when that was done, we, well, that's still a matter of investigation, but it could be in the, in the 18th century, maybe. What's the attitude of so-called old school art historians regarding to uh, technical art history? Are they feeling threatened? Well, some of them might, in a way, because uh, going into the technical detail and, and combining uh, material matter with traditional art history offers you so many more opportunities in, in tracing, and get, getting into the right track of understanding the paintings. Uh, connoisseurship on itself is very valuable, but uh, I think uh, even the most hardline connoisseur today will realize that working together with the scientists and the conservatives in understanding them has a huge benefit for, for everybody. Were you disappointed uh, when it was established, uh, sort of beyond, beyond doubt, that uh, none of these paintings were actually done by Bruegel or uh, Bosch? No, 
because I think we all were aware that uh, to, to pin them down to be either one or the other of these artists would be extremely difficult. You know, the materials in the paintings would be the same, whether they are by one of these masters or not, but uh, we could all see that the el individual elements would not fit entirely with uh, these masters. So no, I don't think we are, but we are getting a much greater and more nuanced picture of that whole period where uh, replicating variations and, and copying uh, paintings was, uh, was a fashion and was a very traditional manner of, yeah, of making a, a appreciated composition known to more people than just uh, to have one version of it.